Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to a beautiful evening in the backyard in Ellensburg, Washington. The local time is 5.46 p.m. And we'll begin at 6 p.m. our discussion of igneous rocks. Thank you for joining us this evening. If you're new to us, I especially hope that this is a pleasant way to spend an hour or so. Amanda's here, keeping her distance. She's a photojournalist from the, Was the uh, Yakima Herald newspaper, Yakima, Washington. So if you hear a few clicks, I don't know, you want to stay off camera? <laughs> so she's clicking away. How are we doing tonight? We doing okay? Moody, Texas. Hello, Chilliwack. Julie from the Horse Heaven Hills. Five by five. Gavin and Joe in the Bay Area. Thank you for joining us tonight, Daniel. Larry in Oswego, Oregon. Jason, a regular, the gifted photographer from the skies. Brussels, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is. I guess the middle of the night there for you guys. Lots of familiar names. Tucson, Tucson Karen. Renton in the hizzy. Hello, John from Chicago. Helen, the usual, in the house. Makes sense. Mostly North Americans here this evening. A stray Aussie or two, a Kiwi maybe, thrown in for good measure. But the Europeans are fast asleep, most of them. Not The hardcore Europeans are with us. Uh, quick look at the schedule. Focus is off? I don't think so. I think that's you. Uh, minerals, last night. Igneous rocks, tonight. Sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Pacific time. Milankovitch cycles, I don't know a thing. I got some work to do for Saturday morning session at 9 a.m. And then a look back to a volcano named Mount St. Helens. Heard of it. 40th commemoration, 40th anniversary of that drama. I know the eruption was May 18th, but we don't do live streams on Mondays, do we? We still doing okay. I was kind of sharp with the gal who had focus problems, so uh, maybe you can help each other here a little bit. Uh, it seems like it's usually a, a kind of a, what is it called, resolution? You go down to that gear thing and you, and you drop yourself down to 720 or 480 or whatever the heck. So I'll leave that to you. I got, I got things to focus on. Ha! Now for the uh, technology people in, on your side, uh, there's a bit of a breeze and the breeze may, breeze may even pick up to even 15 miles an hour, but I don't want to put the uh, cozy fort around the camera to muffle that because I want to use that rear camera again tonight. I was very pleased with it last night and we have some sun here tonight, so I think we should be in good shape. So I think I'm saying you're going to have to handle a little bit of wind noise. Can you do that? We're still functioning, right? I'm gonna ask you just one last time. Can you give me a couple of five by fives or any problems with uh, audio visual? Nova Scotia, hello. Starbuck, Washington, New Zealand, totally fine. Five by, we've had great luck, haven't we? We've had real good luck with, uh, with, uh, with streaming lately. I don't wanna jinx it. Good, I got, I hit the jackpot with the mail today. I don't. You've already know that I'm kind of slightly embarrassed about this, but 
uh, I'm, I'm realizing that people want to share their thanks. So I'm going to do this quickly because I got a bunch of stuff. Tony and Greg from Ellensburg dropped this off at the house. A whole gift basket, a homemade gift basket, including, you guessed it, Rolling Rock beer. The Don from Garden Vinters in town here. These are absolutely addictive. I got to show you what, I've never had anything like this. Have you ever had spiced almonds with these ingredients? I can't believe it. I'm not even a spicy guy. I'm from Wisconsin, you know, but they're excellent. And a book on science and religion and a few other things. So thank you so much, Tony and Greg. Very much appreciate your, your generosity. Candy, thank you for your beautiful card. You're from Juana, Washington, over on Key Peninsula. This is a beautiful card with the footbridge in the Umtanum Creek area. Thank you so much. Helen from Linwood sent a CD, The Songs of Alice Windship from Land to Sea. And I'm like, well, that's nice, some music that I can listen to. And then it gets better because track number five is sung by Helen and it's entitled Great Missoula Floods. I'm sure that I will love hearing you sing that, Helen. I haven't had a chance yet to listen to it, but thank you for that. Julian Prosser, thank you for the piece of mail. What did Julie send? A patch. I got to get my jean jacket out from fourth grade back in 1971. Get this puppy on there and parade around town. You dig? Thank you, Julie. We know, most of us know about the Craters of the Moon inside joke that we have now. And from Ron in Seaside, Oregon, Ron does some handcrafted stone jewelry. And Ron sent a very kind note and said, hey, I saw about the uh, layers of the German chocolate cake getting here to Seaside. So I took a little drive out on State Route 26 knocked off a piece of basalt from your German chocolate cake and made you a bolo tie out of that 16 million year old Grand Ronde lava. So thank you, Ron, for the gift. Bolo tie it is. And there's more. Susan from Kenmore, huge box full of rocks, her own private samples. She's been doing a lot of rock collecting in Nevada and other locations. And so there's all these amazing samples from her rock hounding days. And I assume these are gifts, Susan. If you want them back, I'm happy to send them back to you. 
Uh, I just got them an hour ago, so I won't be able to incorporate them in tonight's talk or tomorrow night's talk, possibly, but from the McDermott area, all sorts of amazing samples. Thank you very much. All the cards and letters, all the emails. I'm way behind on emails. I'm sorry I haven't replied yet. And there's one more. To the professor and the Zent nerds from Lakua, Finland, from Anarika and Taro, Finnish candy, Finnish chocolate, treats from Finland. And I'm standing here talking into an iPhone in my backyard. These are crazy times for many reasons, including the magic of this technology. So thank you, Ana, Rika, and Taro, very much. Well, that's plenty of that. So I'm glad you're with us tonight. Uh, we have uh, three minutes before we begin. Uh, is there anything else we should uh, chat about before I start concentrating on what we're doing here? That town in Maine, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a go one of these nights, but it goes too fast for me. Beezer's out here someplace. He was saying hi to Amanda. Amanda's clicking away. She'll be taking off in a few minutes, maybe. Hello, Jeff from Vinman's Bakery. Okay, I got two minutes. The wind is picking up, but I think it's worth it to use our, let me, let me show you. I think we're gonna be using that sun. We need it for igneous rocks. Thanks for joining us. We'll begin in two minutes. to stand somewhere for you or anything like that or you, you want it to be as natural as possible oh yeah this is fantastic okay good. i like your setup by the way well thanks you jump, took... you jump rope all that <laughs> not going anywhere no no <laughs> oh god i was out here in 30 mile an hour winds one night that was a disaster you know ellensburg is so weak <laughs> it is crazy <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it just stays in here yeah it's uh that's one reason not to move up here for sure the only one, though. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Well, a pleasant good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining us. This is a geology live stream from my backyard here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I teach at the college in town and tonight's topic is igneous rocks. And in fact, this is rock week. 
So I hope that you saw our program last night, and if you didn't and you're watching this in replay form, you might stop right now, go back and find the Minerals live stream, maybe number 41, live stream number 41. Watch that one. It will make much more sense before you watch this one. But if you're live or you just want to freelance and do what you want, I respect that. I'm a freelancer myself. So we're going to go ahead and use much of the content that we learned last night and help us work our way through different kinds of igneous rocks. And I'll use the same kind of preamble slash disclaimer that we had last night, which is I love storytelling. I love to take concepts and make them come alive. I like to take scientific literature and kind of dust it off, you know, and grab a few things and stitch a narrative together, but making sure that those stories fit the field evidence that we have. But tonight is different. Tonight is robotically going through our process of naming different kinds of igneous rocks, which is a crucial part of what we do, of course. You know, the rocks are basically the language, the, yank, the old language that we're learning how to read so that we can tell these stories. But it's just kind of an empty feeling at the end where I want to tell some grand story and there is no story to tell. But you know coming in that that's kind of what we're doing and hopefully that will feel good to you. Last night, oh, the sun's starting to go behind the, the uh, English oak tree here. That's interesting. So you've got to battle some shade here for a second. Um, last night, uh, my, my most proud moment was taking this, this halite and uh, smacked it with a hammer, broke it along some beautiful cleavage planes right between the eyes, and got uh, a nice demonstration of how perfect cleavage planes can be in minerals. We were also looking at a few crystals like this fluorite, which seems to be a popular uh, crystal to look at as well. But that ain't tonight. Tonight, we're looking at rocks. So, do you remember one of the main messages from the first 15 minutes of our session last time? One of the main messages from early last night was that rocks are composed of minerals. And minerals are rarely those big, beautiful crystals that we were just looking at. And I've got plenty more, you know, the quartz crystals and everything else. That's a rare thing. A much more common thing is to have a few of these rock-forming minerals that show up over and over and over and over in these igneous rocks and actually have them show up in this form. And by the way, this is a big mineral tonight. These white rectangles are big compared to some of the other minerals we're going to have to enlarge on the back side of the camera here. So we're going to use some of our mineral knowledge from last night, but the minerals are going to look very different because they're going to be these little stunted versions of themselves as they compete for speed, space inside of a magma chamber beneath a volcano. That's the framework, that's the kind of context for our discussion tonight. But let's not screw around tonight, let's get right to it, okay? And the sun is strong, I'm already starting to sweat. Feels good to be outside with you for a change. I said we weren't screwing around, so let's get right to it. Damn, I don't like that shadow. I'll have to live with it. So these are the six igneous rock names we're going to learn tonight. How many of these names do you recognize? We've certainly talked about basalt a fair amount. We've talked about granite. We all know granite, granite countertops, etc. There's some other names here that don't ring a bell quite as much. But it's one thing just to look at these names. It's another one to actually know how to identify them. Like you're out kicking a rock down the, the hiking trail, and then you stop and pick the thing up, and you break it open with a hammer, and you say, what the hell is this? Is this an igneous rock? Maybe that's how we should start. You pick up a rock on the hiking trail. Can you decide whether the thing is igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic? Like, how do you do that? That's how we'll start. So here's as, as basic I can, as I can make it. I'm really distracted by that shadow. We're moving. You're not plugged in. 
You're not plugged in. We'll try this for a while, see how far I trip over this stuff. Okay? So igneous rocks have two things that are important to observe. First of all, they have fresh minerals. Now, this is not a very scientific word. I'm going to flip you around. Look at that sky, man. I'm glad we changed. Look at that. Newly painted. And puffy clouds in a blue sky. So igneous rocks, eh, eh, there we go. Thank you, Amanda. Igneous rocks have fresh, random minerals. So I'm going to show you, I'm not going to tell you the names yet, but I'm just going to show you some igneous rocks. And I want you to notice, first of all, how randomly these minerals are arranged. There is no pattern. There is no layering. There's no organization. Can you see the random nature of these minerals? Let me show you a few more. Igneous. The minerals are randomly arranged. Igneous, the minerals are randomly arranged. Say it with me next time, in cult-like fashion, please. <laughs> Ready? Igneous, the minerals are randomly arranged. Igneous, the minerals are randomly arranged. Ah, that was a crappy example. I'll give you one more. That's right, drink the Kool-Aid. Igneous, the minerals that we can see, not many of them, right, are randomly arranged. Okay. But it's more than just randomly arranged minerals. They also have to show some signs of being what I call fresh. And fresh minerals, not a scientific term, are minerals that have the ability to reflect light. Does that ring a bell from last night? Is the letter tippy tippy? Yes, it is. The minerals from last night had some cleavage planes, if you recall. And we were taking those, should I do it? Hey, look, my favorite mineral. Potassium feldspar had this ability to flash light. I'm not totally in the right position now to do that. Oh, we can do it. Why not? Remember? Potassium feldspar is a mineral. This is not a rock. That's a mineral. It's not a rock. And if I get this mineral position just correctly, boom, reflective surface. Move it a little bit more, the flash is gone. These are cleavage planes in minerals. What I'm saying is, if you're an igneous rock, not only do you have random arrangements of your minerals, this is a rock now, we know because we can see a bunch of different colors, but as I rotate this igneous rock around, can you see the different uh, flashes of light at different times? Daddy's liking this. This is perfect, man, perfect. This is the underlying look of all igneous rocks. Randomly arranged minerals, fresh minerals. You got it? Now, that is our topic tonight, but let me for to set you up for tomorrow night. Is this an igneous rock? Hell no. 
These are a bunch of fragments of things, fragments of other rocks that have been glued together by Mother Nature. This is a sedimentary rock. And of course, there are hundreds of different kinds of sedimentary rock, but this is not our topic tonight. I don't see randomly arranged fresh minerals here, do you? Right, I don't. So we're not talking about it tonight. We're not talking about sedimentary rocks tonight. You're still here, Amanda. You're having a good time. You gotta get that money shot here. We gotta get that, that best shot. <laughs> I gotta hang on, I gotta find a good metamorphic rock. Nice. This will work. You still there? So here are actually some, this is not my best sample. I'm not totally prepared to do this tonight because it's tomorrow night. But anyway, this is, can you see that there's organization here? That these black and white minerals have a bit of organization to them. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a metamorphic nice, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. Not a great one. And it's really not the best sample to show you to show metamorphic rocks, but my point is metamorphic rocks have the fresh sparkly minerals, but they're not random. They're organized in a particular way. Okay. So you feel semi-comfortable about the difference between tonight and tomorrow night? Igneous tonight, fresh random minerals, uh, sedimentary metamorphic rocks tomorrow night. Okay. Now, now that we know we're not talking about minerals last night, not talking about sedimentary metamorphic rocks, that's tomorrow night. Now we firmly know what's going on and it's time to get down to brass tacks because it's already quarter after six. I want to teach you, if you're interested, how to identify these six rock names. So the three red words and the three blue words are igneous rocks. They all have fresh minerals that are randomly arranged. But you can see I have some stuff here. The top row are lava flow rocks. Igneous rocks have one thing in common. They used to be molten, they used to be magma, and it's a question of whether the magma cooled above or below ground. I'm moving on you, Amanda. Let's use the chalkboard for a second. So you've got magma. You've got the magma underground. Oh, you do? Oh, it's molten? Okay, that's fine. It's liquid. It's hot. It's a thousand degrees centigrade or more in some cases. That's fine. That magma's down here in this magma chamber. Certainly way more complicated than this cauldron that I'm showing you here. But the point is, if we remove the heat completely from that magma, and the magma never leaves this dark underground room, we're going to create some igneous rocks down here. But we're also going to make some igneous rocks if we actually have a volcanic eruption. And we actually take some of that magma, send it to the surface, have it come out of an, eroding, an erupting volcano. Not all volcanoes are shaped like this. That's a topic for another day. But we're going to actually get some kind of a flow of that magma coming onto the surface. A lava flow. So the question is, you're an igneous rock? Okay, that's fine. You used to be molten material that has cooled off. But where did you cool the magma off? And can we tell by physically looking at the rock? The answer is we can tell. I want to teach you in just a second how you can size up the igneous rock, look at it carefully, see the fresh sparkly minerals, see that they're randomly arranged, and go one step further and say, oh yeah, that's magma that cooled underground. Or this is magma that cooled after it came out of an erupting volcano. I mean, this is kind of grade school stuff, which you can do pretty easily. So let's do it. I'm kind of all over the place tonight, partly because I'm a drinking wine, partly because the sun keeps changing with the, uh, maybe I should take out a chainsaw and cut down that beautiful oak tree. Maybe I should, should I do that? Should I do that? Should I just cut that tree down? 
No, I shouldn't do that. So we're looking at an igneous rock. We don't know what the name of it is. The first major question, and it's the hardest question tonight, is what is the texture of the igneous rock? And you're like, okay, I'm a Geology 101 lab student. I didn't prepare for this quiz. So I'm going to be in here during the quiz, like going like this, like texture, like, uh, you know, it's like they don't know what they're doing. It's kind of entertaining if you're a teacher watching students who don't know what the hell they're doing. Take a quiz. Texture, bumpy. No. These are the texture choices for an igneous rock. And what is texture? Texture is the size of the minerals inside of the igneous rock. Buzzwords tonight. I don't do it often, but these are such common igneous rock words that we use that we're going to do them tonight. Affinitic, porphyritic, phaneritic. Those are the three labels we have for igneous rock textures. What's texture? It's not bumpy and smooth. Texture is talking about the size of the minerals inside. And you can see I'm already giving you an interpretation. If your rock has an affinitic texture, that means it's a volcanic igneous rock, meaning that it erupted out of a volcano. It's a lava flow. If your igneous rock has a phaneritic texture, that means that it has a plutonic igneous rock, which means it stayed underground and cooled beneath the volcano in the dark. And there's a third choice, porphyritic, which is totally confusing. Okay, so how should we do this? Let's start with phaneritic, because phaneritic means you can see 100% of the minerals inside of the igneous rock. So that's the easiest. Like it's easiest because we can see all the minerals. So I've already shown you some of these, but I'm going to show you now some examples of some phaneritic igneous rocks. And if they're phaneritic, that's fine. That's our first step. And then we'll see why making that call is important. Phaneritic, you ready? Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. So this guy is a phaneritic igneous rock. I can see the pink stuff. That's actually potassium feldspar. I can see the gray stuff. That's actually smoky quartz. I can see the black stuff, that's actually biotite mica. Three minerals from last night. Phaneritic. Here's a different igneous rock that is also phaneritic. I can see the black stuff, that's biotite. I can see the gray stuff, that's smoky quartz. I can see the white stuff, that's plagioclase feldspar. Phaneritic. This one's challenging, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. This rock is essentially black. It's igneous because I can see fresh, sparkly minerals that are randomly arranged. And even this, because it's a black rock, but has big, beautiful cleavage planes. I'm loving the camera right now. Hopefully you can see these wonderful cleavage planes. That's also plagioclase felsvar, but a dark version of it. So this is also phaneritic. I cannot stop. Here's a phaneritic rock. Obviously, we have beautiful black minerals to look at, but if you look carefully, there's also some white minerals we can see as well. So I've just showed you four examples of igneous rocks that have a phaneritic texture. Who cares? Here's why you should care. Phaneritic texture, 100% visible minerals, means that the magma cooled slowly, and therefore the magma formed in the magma chamber under the volcano. By simply looking at the size of the minerals, you can make a call on the rate of cooling for the magma. 
and phanerytic textures mean that you have a plutonic igneous rock. And plutonic igneous rock means that you formed in a magma chamber underneath an erupting volcano. I don't know if you're aware of it, but I just showed you an example of a gabbro, a diorite, and also two granites. We're not there yet. I haven't uh, helped you see if you don't know. Maybe you're sitting back going, I know all this. I took it. It's like, good for you. But many of us are learning this for the first time, and that's the whole point of this. And so gabbro, diorite, and granite are all three plutonic igneous rocks forming in a magma chamber forming because the magma is cooling very slowly in the dark, and this, have you figured it out yet? The slower the cooling, the bigger the minerals. That's maybe the biggest message of tonight. I'm gonna say it again. I'm gonna look right, right, right between the eyes. I'm gonna look right at you. The slower the cooling of the magma, the bigger the minerals get in an igneous rock. It's a one-to-one -one correlation and it's beautiful. And it's been uh, proven in, in experimental labs around the world for more than a century now. Slower the cooling, bigger the minerals. Slower the cooling, bigger the minerals. Hey, big minerals. Hey, slow cooling. But you can see where we're going. We're eventually going to go to these volcanic eruptions where the magma is coming out of an erupting volcano and the magma cools very quickly. It's forming, it's cooling too quickly to actually form cleavage planes, to actually form big, beautiful minerals. Basically, lava flows are igneous rocks where there was no time to grow the minerals nice and big. So the minerals are microscopic. So, let's look at those. Goodbye. This is obviously a lava flow, is it not? You're looking at the bubbles, and I, I agree with you, so am I. But if we look carefully at the actual rock between the bubbles, I don't see any minerals, do you? I don't see any fresh minerals to look at. I don't see any sparkly little guys here and there. That's because this is an affinitic texture. Affinitic texture means there are no minerals to see. The minerals are there, but they're microscopic minerals. You can only see them underneath the microscope. You can only see them after you slice the rock, paper thin, put it on a glass plate, make a thin section it's called, look at the minerals under a microscope. You can't see them with the naked eye. That's affinitic texture. We're talking about affinitic textures right now which are the volcanic rocks, which are the lava flows. Generally, lava flows have an affinitic texture. They cool too quickly to form minerals of a decent size. Let me show you a couple other examples of affinitic texture. Well, this is an obvious example. I'm like, well, that's kind of a dud. Why'd you pick that one? Well, that's why. I don't see any minerals here, do you? This is an affinitic texture, even to the point of being a glassy texture. But the point is, we don't see any minerals. The minerals are there, but they're microscopic. They're too small to see. Let's see if I can find another affinitic texture for you. No, I can't, because affinitic textures are quite rare. To have a, an igneous rock with 100% invisible minerals is quite rare. So I'm kind of happy with the couple that I showed you. But there is a third category. And this is the portion of the program brought to you by Vinman's Bakery in downtown Ellensburg. You gotta love it. What is? What do you mean, Vinman's Bakery? Well, 100% visible minerals, magma chamber. 100% invisible minerals, lava flow. But there is a third textured choice, this word called porphyritic. 
I know these are cumbersome words to say, but we use them all the time. Can you guess what a porphyritic texture is? It's a rock that has both visible and invisible minerals in the same rock. Let's look at some. Porphyritic texture. I can see big, beautiful plagioclase feldspar minerals. Those are the rectangular ones. Those are the white ones. But I used this rock last night, do you recall? And I said that if we really get down to the details, I can't see because it's too, it's out of focus. I'm too close to the camera. But in that dark stuff, there's tons of microscopic minerals. You're looking at a porphyritic texture, visible and invisible in the same rock. Let me give you another one. Porphyritic texture. You're like, I don't see anything. Well, hang on now. Look carefully. Can I get things to flash for you? There's a few little minerals you can see. Can you see a few little sparkles here and there? There's, that's pretty good, isn't it? So this is mostly microscopic, but there are some minerals. So this is porphyritic. Let's do a few more. Porphyritics are fun. This is a special sample for the uh, live stream fan who's absolutely obsessed with the Titan andesite. Here it is. You're looking at the Titan andesite. But more importantly, you're looking at an igneous rock that has beautiful white visible minerals a bunch of microscopic minerals in the black that's porphyritic in texture, right? How about this one? This was collected from the lava dome inside of Mount St. Helens. And can you see that there are some visible minerals in here? There we go. Pretty good, right? I'm sorry if I'm making you queasy. Dale, have you thrown up yet? For other reasons, Dale, or have you thrown up for this reason? Okay. So, question for you, and I'll wait for your answer. How is it possible to actually have a porphyritic texture? How is it possible to have an igneous rock with both visible and invisible? Because I thought we said the size of the minerals uh, are a direct correlation to the the rate of cooling the magma. How can you have both in the same rock? Can you think of a scenario where that would work? Extrusion, says Helen the singer. Cooling at different temperatures. Yeah, I think that would kind of work, but there's a more on-the-nose way to do it. Yeah, some of you have got it. Here's the general message. Oh, you have a porphyritic texture, which means you have visible and invisible minerals in the same rock. And the visible minerals are from slow cooling, but the invisible minerals are from quick cooling. How about we do this? Bunch of magma underneath the volcano. Start to slowly cool that magma underground. In the magma, let's get some solid minerals forming. In other words, let's crystallize some big minerals because the magma is cooling slowly. But then, before we cool the rest of the magma and form a phaneritic texture, let's have an eruption. And let's have the magma that comes out of the erupting volcano have some minerals actually preformed inside to actually have what we call phenocrysts. I'm big with the words tonight, apparently. Phenocrysts are the visible minerals 
that are surrounded by invisible minerals. So, in the Tiatinandesite, we have phenocrysts of plagioclase feldspar surrounded by invisible black stuff. But I'm saying that when there was an eruption of the Tiatinandesite lava flow 600,000 years ago, God dang. These white guys formed underneath the volcano, then the lava came out of the volcano with the white chunks in it, and all the black stuff cooled quickly around the outside. It's almost like, it's almost like a present from Gene Gene the Dancing Machine in Puyallup, Washington. Last night, Gene had Jeff, the owner of Vinman's Bakery, I don't know if he requested it or not, but the owner of the bakery drove up to my house and dropped off a bunch of freshly made cookies. They're still smashed, they still smell wonderful 24 hours later. But inside, is an amazing collection of different kinds of cookies. Almost lost Detroit there, hang on. So what is the analogy we can use tonight? Porphyritic textures are like cookies. Oh, it's a chocolate chip cookie? Well, we can see the chocolate chips, but we can't see the grains of vanilla and sugar and butter. We better test that out. Chocolate chip cookie, porphyritic texture. I can see the chocolate chips, but I can't see all the other ingredients inside of this porphyritic cookie. Oh, oatmeal raisin? Oh, you got me an oatmeal raisin, Gene? Also porphyritic. Different minerals, different taste, but we have a variety of sizes of minerals inside of our igneous rock. Oh, ginger snap? This is aphanitic. As a good ginger snap should be, I don't see any, what is this? There's no phenocrysts. There's no visible minerals inside of this cookie. Phenocrysts, porphyritic textures. I'm going too slow for you. I don't care. Feeling okay? All right. We really have one more step. It's harder to move the ladder when you got tons of rocks sitting on it. There's one more step and that is, we haven't come up with the names of the rocks yet, but we've done the hardest part which is actually making a call on texture. I hope that you realize now the difference between these three texture turns. I can't do any more than use cookies and other things. So now for the rest of tonight, we're on this chart. And we're saying that basalt and gabbro, andesite and diorite, rhyolite and granite, have different textures and have different chemistries, different minerals. I need a white, I need a marker. It's like I was talking to Amanda, she's gone. Okay, so it's home free now, we're ready to go. 
I think I'm just going to do this verbally and then I'm going to show you a bunch of examples, okay? Because I don't want to go back and forth between the whiteboard and rock samples too much or you're going to get seasick if you haven't already, okay? So this is using previous uh, live streams we've done. So I'm going to go quickly, assuming you have some prior knowledge. There's different amounts of silica present on planet Earth. Therefore, there's different magma systems that have different amounts of silica, which is silicon and oxygen combined together at the atomic level. So you can have 45% silica, 60% silica, or 75% silica worldwide. Low silica magmas all the way up to high silica magmas. We have no magmas on this planet that have more than 75% silica, none less than 45, but we do have a range between 45 and 70. We have names for those silica contents. Magmas that have 45% silica are called mafic magmas. Magmas that have high silica contents are called felsic magmas. And because we're not imaginative people as geologists, the magmas that have 60% silica are called intermediate magmas. Okay, so there's a range of silica content. Turns out there's actually a global pattern to where you find these different kinds of magmas. Oh, you want to find this rock bottom silica value magma? You want to find the mafic stuff? Go to the oceans. You'll find a bunch of it. You want to find this felsic stuff that's got the high silica values? Go to the continents. You'll find a bunch. You want to find this hybrid, this magma that has a combo of 45 and 75, like they've been mixed together, like they've been literally mixed together, like some sort of paint. I don't even know if that works. Sure. Go to the coasts. So I've hit this hard in other volcano discussions we've had. There's a global pattern to where you find these different kinds of magmas. Therefore, there's a global pattern to where you find these six kinds of rocks. Like, where should you find most of the basalt on planet Earth? The answer is in the oceans. Where should you find most of the rhyolite on planet Earth? The answer is continents. Where should you find all the diorite? Should be in a coastal situation. That's the global pattern. Now, of course, there's a story when you got basalt in the middle of the continent. Or if you have rhyolite in the middle of the ocean. Actually, that doesn't exist, but whatever. There is plenty of basalt in the middle of a continent. There's even gabbro in the middle of the continent. My grandma Helen used to live in Duluth, Minnesota. She had a cliff in her backyard made out of gabbro. 1.1 billion year old gabbro. So there's a global pattern, but there's also exceptions to the global pattern, and that's what makes it fun to tell stories, including the German chocolate cake, which is a lot of basalt that should be in the oceans, but it's actually in eastern Washington and eastern Oregon. But we're not here for story time tonight. I couldn't help it. I had to do a little bit. The last thing I'm doing, yep, the last thing I'm doing before we go to your live questions and answers, your questions, my answers, is how can we tell the difference between these guys? Different markers. There are three key minerals. Oh, good Lord, we got the neighbors here now. Dennis and Teresa. Pull up a chair now, you might learn something, old corn-fed Iowa person. All right, do you remember quartz from last night? In igneous rocks, quartz is almost always a gray color. We call it smoky quartz. And so that quartz, if you find quartz in an igneous rock, you have to be over here. So I'm giving you some tangible rules now. Finally, finally, I'm giving you something to actually look for in your samples, in your igneous rock samples. Can you positively identify quartz? I'll show you how in just a second. Did you set that up? Is that muffler boy, is that your friend? So if we can positively identify quartz, we know we have either rhyolite or granite. 
Do you remember my favorite mineral? Kids, you asked me what my favorite mineral was? Potassium feldspar, right? Same thing. If we can find potassium feldspar in an igneous rock, it's either rhyolite or granite. So this is a powerful tool. We can get ourselves over on the right-hand side of the chart and therefore get into felsic magmas and therefore be in a continental setting if we can find potassium feldspar, quartz, or both. But what's the last part of this? There's a texture difference between rhyolite or granite. Rhyolite's the chocolate chip cookie because, by the way, if we have a porphyritic texture, remember that's the chocolate chip cookie, that's the oatmeal raisin cookie, the one that has the visible and invisible minerals in the same rock, porphyritic means we're gonna go up in the chart. And you're like, give me a break. I'm just sitting here in the middle of the night in Finland. I, I don't want any more rules from you. I just want you to show me more beautiful looking rocks. And it's coming. But we need this, this arrangement here to really make it all work. So I'm about to show you felsic igneous rocks with 100% visible minerals I don't have any rhyolites with 100% invisible minerals, affinitic, but I do have some rhyolites. In fact, I've already showed them to you, I think, that are porphyritic rhyolites. Do you have an image in your mind? Oh, this is beautiful stuff. Back of the camera. Look at that. Oh, baby. That's a good looking granite, probably from Vermont. Do you see the potassium feldspar? Those are the orange guys. They have cleavage planes. And something we didn't talk about last night and not great in this sample, so let me ignore it. Here's another granite from another location. The potassium feldspars are bigger, aren't they? They still have the cleavage planes. Oh God, those are nice. Not metamorphic nice, knock it off. I need to get a granite with some quartz in it, hang on. I mean some obvious quartz. Yeah. Plenty of quartz here. Can you see? or something so that gray stuff in there that's smoky quartz smoky quartz smoky quartz quartz never has cleavage so this quartz in these igneous rocks looks like blobby gray glassy blobs that's what smoky quartz looks like Hello. Okay, that's good looking granite. Now you're like, well, that's not the granite I know. I've got like a salt and pepper granite. It's like, okay, yeah, you're right, you do. Good for you. We still have the smoky quartz though, don't we? So if we've got quartz, we know we're in the uh, felsic magmas. So we were here, now I want to go up here and find, if it hasn't dawned on you yet, the minerals in granite and the minerals in rhyolite are the same damn thing. It's the same magma. It's just a texture difference, that's all. It's like the same batch of cookie dough. It's just a question of are we going to have uh, porphyritic or are we going to like cook it so that all the, no, it doesn't work. So you want to see some rhyolite. Well, here's some beautiful rhyolite. This is from Yellowstone Park. Park. 
So you can see some fresh sparkly, those are, those are quartzes, but it's a chocolate chip cookie, right? We can mostly see just the chocolate chips. We can't see anything else. Rhyolite. Here's another one that's less sexy. Oh, that's actually not bad. Kind of sexy. Focus is tough though on this little guy. One more. Rhyolite. The pink is from the potassium feldspar inside. Are you getting bored yet? I got a few more rocks to show you and then we'll, open, we'll turn it over to you. You can see the peanut gallery now behind me. That was your moment in the sun. You're done now, okay? So we're gonna leave the felsic magmas, which is a continental story, and let's drop down now. Let's lose some silica, which means we lose some viscosity, by the way. We get runnier magmas if we go this way. And now we're in the coasts of the world with stratovolcanoes primarily. And I want to show you some diorite and then some andesite. Hope you're up for this. Yes, Helen, I'm feisty tonight. It's the new me. I'm tired of the Mr. Rogers. This is the real me unfortunately. This is the moment where I look for, oh here. So, diorite. Ah, I need to give you something. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't know if we talked about Hornblend last night. Oh yeah, we did, we did. Do you remember Hornblend? Hornblend was a black mineral. Hornblend was a black mineral that had uh, two cleavage planes, 60 degrees and 120. Do you remember now? I I've got that big one here somewhere, but I don't think I'll be able to find it. But the cool thing is that in igneous rocks, if this is a rock, be distracted by Dennis and his beautiful wife now. I'll come over here. I could I could tell. Here's a great tip for you. In igneous rocks that have hornblende, the hornblende are black minerals that are long and thin. I kind of have a nickname for the hornblende minerals. The hornblends are like pine needles. They're dark colored and they're long and thin. So let me show you a good looking horn blend. And you're like, why would I care? Well, the horn blends tell us where we are in the chart. I'm telling you that andesite and diorite igneous rocks are usually loaded in horn blend. And if you have horn blend, you're in the middle of the chart. You can't be in the right or the left. Bolo tie was a gift, by the way. It's not a midlife crisis. Or maybe it is. Look at that. The black minerals you're looking at are long and thin. These are horn blends. So what's the name of this rock? It's a phanritic texture and it has horn blend. I'll wait. I know the comments are delayed, but are they delayed that much? What's the name of this rock? Thank you, Jim. Rich, uh, I saw Jim at least. Star Climber, very good. Horn blend and phanaritic texture means we have a horn blend. Well done. Now, let me ask you without even showing you, what if you have a porphyritic texture with horn blend? What if you have a porphyritic texture with horn blend? What's the name of this rock? Uh, can you, can, you can see the horn blends, hopefully. Can you? Yeah, this is. Andesite, good, Jim. Steven, star climber, William, correct. Well done. Saab, nice. Okay.
So if you like, we can do this. I'll, I'll show you, um, I'll show you magmas that are identical except for the size of the minerals. Identical elements, identical minerals, identical magma, identical geographic location. The only difference is this is the diorite that formed in the magma chamber. This is the andesite, the stuff that came out of the volcano. That's kind of fun. I've never done that before. Let's try it with uh, uh, the felsic stuff. You tell me, what are the two rocks I'm going to grab right now? Felsic, plutonic, felsic, volcanic. What are the two rock names? Good. Boy, Jim is on it. Potassium, feldspar, and quartz. Uh, not great. Where's that good granite? Potassium, feldspar, and quartz. Granite. Potassium, feldspar, and quartz. Rhyolite. The granite formed underneath the magma chamber, underneath the volcano. The rhyolite formed when the lava came out of the volcano and cooled quickly. And this stuff's very stiff like toothpaste. Starting to see these chemical twins? Pretty cool, isn't it? Two more. I've said the worst for the last. They're the worst because they're black rocks and you can't really see much. I think I'll just to save time. No. So what are the last two rocks that were in our, we only had six rocks. What are the last two? You caught my trick. I ask you a question so I can have time to go find something. Good, Bill. The last two pairs I want to show you are gabbro and basalt. Same routine, I don't need to go through it again, I hope. But the difference is, we're gonna have, basically if you're over on this side of the chart, the, min the minerals are black. You basically have black rocks made out of black minerals. It's very difficult to identify them. But the general rule holds that if we're down here, we have phanaritic textures, 100% visible. If we're up here, we have porphyritic textures, chocolate chip cookie. So how do we tell if we're looking at a basalt or a gabbro? Well, here's a, actually a pretty good looking basalt. Do you want the macro lens? Pretty good looking basalt. I don't like that sun angle. All right. That's pretty good, isn't it? You can see phenocrysts. You can see some um, feldspar grains. Quartz is never in these black rocks. Quartz is on the wrong side of the chart for that. But here's gabbro, which I showed you earlier. A very rare rock, I might add, because globally, where do gabbros typically form? They form in oceanic settings in magma chambers. Like, how the hell are you even going to get to something like that? It's very unusual to get yourself to a bunch of gabbro, but somebody did. Oh, I know where I've collected these in Duluth. Forgot, right. So here's our last set. Less uh, intoxicating maybe than the others, but maybe you can see a texture difference. And you can see that this is gabbro in the magma chamber in an oceanic setting. And here's basalt that forms on the surface. A couple of oddballs to throw in if you're still waiting for your favorite igneous rock. I probably don't have it, but I got a couple other things to share with you. And then we'll go to your live Q&A. I'm at this for another 20 minutes probably, so. Nice that you dropped by. There's some cookies here if you want. Um, so everybody loves obsidian, and I understand why. I do too. 
I showed you this obsidian, and she's like, that's not obsidian. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it is. I've showed you this obsidian before from Oregon. Here's an obsidian. Another one. So these are black rocks, and so you would think this is kind of like on the basalt end of things, but if you actually look carefully at obsidian around the world, it's very rare to have obsidian with a low silica value, and instead almost all of the obsidian worldwide is felsic. It's the high silica stuff. And you're like, well, why is it black then? And that, the, the basic answer, which is kind of unsatisfying, is that many obsidians look black because you're looking at a lot of it. And if you can somehow shave obsidian paper thin, as some of you may have done, if you've done some flint napping or whatever, you know that obsidian doesn't have any black minerals in it. So it's like you get kind of a cloud. You kind of, the, 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 the more depth you have with the obsidian, the more of a, of a clouded dark color you have, but the dark color is not from dark minerals. It's from this business of having felsic magma that cooled extremely quickly. That's why we have this glassy look to this obsidian. And I don't have an answer for the different colored swirls and things. I'm not sure anybody really does. Okay, that's obsidian. That's all I have to say about obsidian. Maybe you want something about pumice and scoria. There's a glass of water, I promise it's water, okay? Here is some pumice that is volcanic rock, but it's mostly, it's mostly pore space. A pumice is, is so lightweight because it's mostly open air space. And these pumice, this is also felsic magma you're looking at. So this is basically rhyolite that's been frothed like uh, whipped butter at the vent of a volcano. And then what's scoria? Scoria is also very lightweight, but with scoria, the bubbles are usually interconnected and it's not quite the same consistency of pumice. So this is like basically whipped mafic magma, and this is whipped like whipped butter felsic magma. We got the sun going behind a cloud now. So you've heard about pumice, right? Is the same true for scoria? It kind of wanted to. I'm surprised that scoria tried to float like the pumice. Ah, eh, not really. Hey, here's to you. We can throw in some volcanic lahar and a few other oddball things. I'll finish my portion of the program with a couple of charts that are dense, but complement what we were trying to do here tonight. And then we turn it to you. These are from just some Geology 101 lab texts. Super overpriced. This one's pretty good though. So there's our different rocks that we were talking about. They've organized them backwards. I'm kind of a basalt on the left going to rhyolite on the right. That's just how I roll. I'm a rebel. I'm dangerous. I'm a basalt on. That's how I get against the man. But then you, they've done a nice job here of, of showing the uh, 
relative percentages of common rock forming minerals in those rocks we've been talking about here tonight. And here's another way to do it. Also with granite on the right, or on the left. So that's kind of what we were just doing. But here's another way to show the main common rock forming minerals. And there's a way to kind of, the fatter the wedge, the more common they are in certain kinds of rocks. So you could Google this, you can have Alexa help you find a few of those charts and you can have a grand old time. Okay, thank you for your attention, more than 900 people. That's awfully nice to know that you're that many people here attending us live. And uh, it's now time for me to get the laptop, read your uppercase typed questions, and I'll try to blow through as many as I can in the next 10 to 15 minutes. I'm going to get off a of top chat. I'm going to live chat like a boss. I'm going to come back, ignore the uppercase statements. Justin, what is the mineral makeup rock type of the Tianaway basalts and the CRB feeder dikes? Um, so Justin is asking about two uh, basalt lava flows that are here in Eastern Washington. Their ages are significantly different. Their magma reservoirs are significantly different, Justin. Uh, there's typically more phenocrysts in the Tianaway basalt. You can see more chocolate chips or raisins in the oatmeal raisin cookie. The Columbia River basalt lavas are usually aferic, meaning that they don't have hardly any phenocrysts to look at, with the exception of the ginkgo lava flow, the rosa lava flow have a few noticeable things, but other than that, it's very difficult to see fundamental differences between those, those magma bodies. They're not connected because they're separated by tens of millions of years, but I think you know that. Yeah, Daniel, thank you for the question, age 12. Is it true that you find more igneous rock closer to the coast, and if so, why? Generally, Daniel, that is true that if you go back to Iowa or Wisconsin, where it's very boring for geology, there aren't hardly any igneous rocks to look at. The main reason for that is when you're at the edge of a tectonic plate, you have collisions between plates and you have plates diving and generating magmas at the coasts. So you're right on the mark there, Daniel. You typically don't get magmas in the middle of plates unless you have a geologic hotspot or a rift margin somehow. Mark wants to know, what is monzonite? I forget, it's not metamorphic. It, there's a lot of other names for igneous rocks that don't fall nicely in our six boxes. I think I even quickly saw somebody ask dacite or trachyte or monzonite or cyanite. Like most things, there's tons and tons of smaller names that apply to kind of unique situations. I can't remember off the top of my head what a monzonite is, so it must not be very common. Or I'm a very dim person, that's also possible. Patrick, age six, how do you tell how many cleavage planes a mineral has when it's in a rock? So you can identify it, do you have to have a microscope? Excellent question as always, Patrick. You're right, when we're looking at a mineral that's now in a rock, we only really have one surface to look at, Daniel. We can't do the whole thing of counting the sides and figuring out that sort of thing. So when I tell my students how to do this, they basically ask exactly what you just asked, but they do it with kind of an attitude. How am I supposed to do this? It's so small. I don't even know how I'm supposed to do this. This is ridiculous. And then I slap them across the face. No, I don't. But I basically say, let's think this out. How can we do it? 
in your mineral set, you've actually got big versions of potassium feldspar and hornblende and quartz. Can't we look at those properties and then look at tinier versions inside of the rock, even though we can't see all sides of it? I'll bet we can do it. And you can. Daniel, I don't strike my students. I would never do that and still have a job. Evelyn, age seven, can you explain how snowflake obsidian is, for, uh, is formed? What sample number three of the last set similar? Or was sample th number three of the... Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, I don't know. I don't know where sample number three is. I thought maybe you were talking about this one, but maybe you're not. Um, I don't know. I think there's some rock and mineral club people that are part of our live stream tonight. Would you mind helping out, Evelyn? I don't know the answer for snowflake obsidian. It's a common uh, form of obsidian. I've never heard a satisfying answer. Evelyn, I hope somebody can help you here in the chat. Would only an older volcano be able to produce an eruption that includes somewhat cooled minerals in the magma? And why doesn't it remelt? Gavin, less than 10 years old. Let me try to read your question again, Gavin. Would only an older volcano be able to produce an eruption that in includes somewhat cooled minerals? Oh, I see, the, the, the porphyritic thing, where you have a, a volcano that's erupting lava that already has chocolate chips in it, that happens even with current volcanoes. It doesn't have to be an older volcano, uh, Gavin. It's a good question, but um, that's a process that's still going on. And those porphyritic textured lava flows are still forming that particular way. William, is rock from lahars igneous or covered tomorrow? Well, let's look at a lahar. Uh, it's crumbly. I don't want it to fall on my laptop. Hang on. <laughs> so here's... I'll, I'll do this for you here. Do you, do you see stuff falling off here? Yeah, you heard it, didn't you? So this, oh, what the heck. So this is a lahar, which has fresh minerals in it that are randomly arranged. Can you see the sparkles? And yet a lahar is a volcanic mud flow where you have blocks of pumice and other things that are kind of coming down with the slurry. So it's tonight, I've forgotten your name already. It's tonight for sure, it's igneous, lahars are igneous, uh, but there is kind of a transport process and it's not just a magma system kind of sitting there. It's not even really a lava flow that's flowing over the surface. But by definition, a lahar is tonight because we do have these, let me try one more time. Because we do have these fresh, random, sparkly minerals. Remember, that was our whole rule tonight. Everything we were going to look at tonight, think of all the different kinds of looks and weights and colors we've had tonight and crumbliness versus very solid. I haven't even broken a rock open for you yet tonight. I should break a rock open for you. Now it'd be easy if I did this because this is a lahar. Hi-ya! That was easy. But a rock that's a little harder to break open will take a little bit of effort. I've got glasses on. Okay. Get it. Nailed it. Okay. So some igneous rocks are very difficult to break open, as you just saw. Back to you. Can you remelt igneous rocks? If so, does the magnetite reset? There are definitely um, 
granites that have multiple generations of melting, Jack. You have things called xenoliths, which are former granites that then got remelted and maybe not totally assimilated, so that's not actually answering your question directly. You're getting at the uh, paleomagnetism story of the granites, and I don't know about that, but those guys have done such careful work and they know how magnetite grains work with different batches of melting like that, that I don't think it's a problem with their results, but what do I know? Sophia, what about alkaline igneous rocks? Oh, I just don't use that approach to igneous rocks. Uh, that's a certain group of igneous rocks that have a certain chemistry, Sophia, that's wanting to ask about it, but I, I, I don't tend to emphasize that, so therefore I don't remember much about it. Many of these are teaching choices that I made long ago, and I've just kind of stuck with those approaches that seem to be working with certain students. Thanks for the questions. I always appreciate it. Do the, uh, does obsidian have a cleavage plane? Well, there is something called rock cleavage, which is different than the mineral cleavage we were talking about last night. Believe me, I'm a fan of cleavage. But the rock cleavage is different. That's kind of fractures within rocks that you can break with a hammer and they break along those zones of weakness. But there is no cleavage plane within obsidian, even the rock cleavage that I'm aware of. Are the crystals different sizes in a magma chamber depending on the depth within the chamber? There's been a lot of study of that gourd about crystal size distribution. In fact, a former colleague of mine here, Wendy Borson, has been studying that for a long time. And by studying the crystal sizes and their distribution across the magma chamber, you can make some interpretations about the history of and the rates and the temperatures of those magma systems. And I don't know much more than that. Uh, but I can't give you a general rule, Gord, to say that the big minerals are forming at the bottom or at the top or the sides. I think there is a concept of, of minerals crystallizing out and then falling to the bottom of the magma chamber, but that's about all I know there. Matt wants to know what type of igneous rocks are the Cascade volcanoes made of? Well, if I'm teaching Geology 101, and I guess I kind of am right now. I say andesite and diorite because we're in a coastal situation and it makes sense to just talk about an intermediate magma. But the truth is you can find all kinds of igneous rocks just within Mount Rainier National Park. You can find rhyolites, you can find basalts. It's a very complicated suite of magma chemistries and therefore different kinds of igneous rocks. So like most things, you can kind of give a nice, simple, broad message, and most people are like, oh, okay, I get it. I followed that. I learned something tonight. Uh, but almost all these statements have some deeper complexities. What would we expect to see in an igneous rock above 75% silica, for example, on another planet? Great question. I don't know. You, 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 from your question, you know that we don't have anything higher than 75 here. And I don't know about lavas on other planets. I assume it's just basaltic, but I don't know that. Is all rhyolite welded tough? No, there's some rhyolite that truly just forms a, a rhyolite plug, a lava dome, and it doesn't blast away. It might eventually become a welded tough, but there are some very clear blotches of rhyolite, or you can think of obsidian. An obsidian dome is basically rhyolite. People were hung up last night on conchoidal fracture. That surprised me. Um, I mentioned last night with minerals that if you break a mineral with cleavage, it will break along those interior cleavage planes. It'll break in an organized way. If you break a mineral without cleavage, like quartz, it will just break irregularly. That's what conchoidal fractures are. If you break a, a beer bottle off the end of a bar, that's conchoidal fracture of that Miller Lite bottle. There's no pattern to it. And obsidian has that conchoidal fracture as well. Are there igneous rocks east of the Mississippi? Oh, sure there are. If we go to the other coast, uh, there's lots of batholiths, big blotches of magma 
that were related to when that was the active edge of North America. And, you know, truth be told, if we go to Wisconsin, you get old enough, there's some pre-Cambrian igneous rocks. But generally, it's a pretty quiet place for igneous rocks. Uh, a few more. We're at quarter after seven. How about three or four more? and We'll call it a night. What causes phenocrysts in some basalt flows and not others from the Carlson family? I guess the simple answer is it, it depends on what's going on in the magma chamber. If that, if that uh, mafic magma, I don't know if I'm going to come up with a basic rule for you, but you're right that, that some basalts have lots of chocolate chips in it and other basalts hardly have any chocolate chips, I guess because I just said that. It might just have to do with how long the magma was sitting there and cooling underground. Maybe we can make a general statement that the longer the magma is slowly cooling, the more likely you'll have some chocolate shifts that start to, to develop before the eruption happens. But now that I say that out loud, I'm not sure that's, that's accurate. Is island lava mafic or intermediate like Hawaii, for example? It's definitely all mafic in Hawaii. There's only really one kind of rock in Hawaii. It's called basalt. I'm sure we'll have some people who will correct me on some tiny details, but for the most part, it's basalt all the way. Uh, there are some other islands that are closer to a subduction zone where you can get some fractional crystallization and you can evolve the magma so that you can get some higher silica magmas in there. But you mentioned Hawaii, and that's mafic all the way. How are geodes classified or classed? Well, that's more last night, Jack. The, the geodes are these uh, beautiful crystals that are forming in an open space. Remember, most of our rocks don't have space for the minerals to grow, so they compete for space, and they end up as stunted growths. But if you have that open cavity and you have the right fluids and the right temperature for those hot fluids, you're going to develop these beautiful crystals. And that's what a geode is. It's the former open place that you're now holding in your hand. It's basically you've got a... You've got Swiss cheese. You with me? Big block of Swiss cheese. Got a bunch of holes in it, right? And now we're going to flip a switch and we're going to start filling all those holes in the Swiss cheese with uh, peanut butter. No, with, uh, with jawbreakers. Okay? Swiss cheese, every hole filled with jawbreakers. Now, let's uh, put the block of Swiss cheese with every hole filled with jawbreakers in the oven. Let's crank up the temperature. Let's melt all the Swiss cheese. Damn, this is good. I'm good. Okay, we wait an hour. Now we go in. The cheese is all gooey on the bottom. It melted out. But what's laying in the rack? All these jawbreakers that used to be in the holes, but now the only thing left are the things that filled the holes. That's what an agate is. Man, I should close on that. I'm closing on that. Mmm. A toast to you. Here's our mug of uh, polished cobbles. Let's get our pumice in there. And our scoria. Here's to your health. Here's to the health of your family, all of your very valued family members, older family members, younger family members. Here's to everyone in your country, functioning hopefully in a meaningful way. All parts of your country, including high levels of government. And forget about countries. We're all on this planet together. It's so special that you can all join us for each of these from this dinky little backyard in this dinky little town in the state of Washington. Here's to you.
And here's to us. Amen. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is a discussion of sedimentary and metamorphic rocks from out here in the backyard. Different rules, different rocks, but that will be the third part of this trilogy and hopefully you'll feel some sense of satisfaction that we've gone through rock week together and we've lived to tell about it. Good night from Ellensburg, Washington. Thanks again for joining us. Good night. I love you. Looking at that night sky. That's a nice sky. <laughs>